Welcome, Spartans, to another Halo Book Club with Podcast Evolve. I'm your host, Oren, and with me is Aaron. Hi, guys. Krista. Hello. And David. Hello, everybody. Welcome, everyone. Uh, This month's book club is Halo First Strike, the kind of third installment to the original Halo trilogy uh, that was released way, way back just a few years ago that we're getting around to just talking about now. Uh, Very excited to kind of wrap this uh, story up, put a nice end to uh, all of the current currently released Halo novels as we begin to embark on what's new and up and coming in the Halo universe. Before we get started about First Strike, uh, I just wanted to remind everyone to check out our website, if you haven't already, at halopodcastevolve.com. It features all of our other shows, like our main show, Podcast Evolve, so our general weekly either lore or news show. We have Mission Debrief that dives into all the campaign missions of every Halo game. We have Builds with Blocks, our new evolved show that's centered around the micro-action figures and brick-based construction sets. And we also have a Patreon page. Uh, it's patreon.com slash Halo Podcast Evolved. Uh, you can check that out. You can kind of see some exclusive content if you want to be a supporter. You get episodes early and things like that. We, we want to thank all of our patrons who are currently subscribed to us. Thank you for your monthly donations, and and hope you enjoy the extra content that you have. Definitely a huge help. We're very grateful uh, with your continued support. We love you. Finally, we want to encourage our listeners who want more to listen to to support Audible. Uh, listening to the growing collection of Halo novels all in one place, along with thousands of other novels and guidance or boldness programs, podcasts, and other originals on audible.com. Uh, you can use this URL called audibletrial.com slash podcast evolved, where you can learn more about their programs and start your free trial today. And with all that, I believe, Aaron, you're going to be kind of walking us through the first strike novel. Uh, it's pretty jam packed, lots of good blue team and red team uh, action in it. Let's uh, take it away. Okay, Spartans, I'm just going to cut in here for a minute because in our enthusiasm to record the book club, someone forgot to mention all of the basic info for First Strike. So I will just run through it quickly here. Of course, it is Halo First Strike. The author is Eric Nyland. It was originally published by Del Rey Books. Tor Books took care of the 2010 version. It is print, digital and audio. The release dates were the 2nd of the 12th, 2003. And then the 21st to the 12th, 2010 was the definitive edition. And then we got the 343 re-release on the 19th of the 3rd, 2019. It was originally 352 pages long. It now comes in at a whopping 480 pages. And that will do us. So now we will bounce back to the very enthusiastic Podcast Evolve crew. Thank you. Oh god, right. We gotta go through all of this. <laughs> this book is so filled with stuff, it's insane. It's like three different books. It is. I f- like some of this kind of blended with the first novel, Fall of Reach, for me, because I read Fall of Reach and I'm like, I could have sworn they went on the planet at some point, and I read First Strike. I'm like, it's part of this book? <laughs> all the Reach stuff is in this book? There's a lot of things like that we are like, well, um, okay. See, when I volunteered to do this book, I forgot it was complicated, and in my head, it was much more straightforward. <laughs> in my head, this book was just all about the uh, unyielding hierophant, and that's like the last two chapters. I was the same, like, in the same as the Halo Reach, there, the fall of Reach, Reach falls like the last quarter of the book. And it's the same, the, the first strike moment is like the last quarter of this book, and like, just so much more to it that's nothing to do it well it is all building up to it but like yeah i'd say like after to kind of get ahead of it but like after we like actually leave reach like that moment is like and and through the rest of the book is really the only thing i remembered <laughs> when i was rereading this book i was like holy cow there's so much that i forgot happened in this book because it's been like 10 years since i've read it yeah and that's before we get into the complicated stuff time travel what <laughs> right i think We've decided beforehand the easiest way to do this is we will briefly summarize each section and we will jump in when we have bits we really want to talk about. 
because there's a lot to talk about. Shall we start with section one? Sorry, section zero. Oh, good. (laughs) So, section zero is the bit that Krista thought was actually the fall of Reach. It's not. It's here. This section covers, uh, if I remember rightly, Fall of Reach covers John and Blue Team going to Gamma Station, and we never hear anything again about the Spartans that go down to Earth because they kept it for this novel. It's kind of a big start to all this. Like, it's very... It kicks off sort of really high adrenaline. Would that be the right way to say it? Yeah, it, it really throws you into the action and just kind of... It really picks up as if it just cut away from John and, and Linda and James doing their kind of space mission. And then, like, immediately kills Spartan 2s, like, like, they're nothing. I know! So many Spartans die in this, I was, like, so, like, mortified. I mean, they're dropping left and right. It's like they just sort of chuck them at a leaf shredder to see who survived. There's a lot of it. <laughs> it's true. I think this is probably, this and maybe Legacy of Onyx might be the two most memorable starts to novels there's just there's something about this that i always remember it brings us in we've got the spartan twos on the pillar of autumn keys has just left he's done his brief or he's just arrived and done his briefing with master chief and they've come up with a plan that master chief is going to take two other spartans and he's going to go to gamma station and take out the navigation crystal from the ship that hasn't been deleted and Fred gets everyone else, and he gets to go and protect the generators on Reach. And Fred's doing this sort of, like, funky balance the knife on the tip of his finger thing. Oh, yeah. He realises the shit hits the fan when the knife moves, and he realises the Pillar of Autumn's done a U-turn. And then they do something which is a bit of a stretch, I think. They squeeze 22 Spartans into the back of a pelican and fly them to Reach. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't change that to, like, a long sword or something. Well, they didn't have the Condor back then. Well, they didn't have it in, in canon, but they could have in their one of the rewrites. Yeah, I'm surprised actually when they did the rewrites, didn't they change the dropship in Fall of Reach that the kids were on to not a pelican, it's something that bigger. I'm surprised they didn't go with that here, but we get a pelican and they go with the excuse that we took the seats out of the back, therefore there's enough room. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like you might be able to squeeze 20 Spartans in there, but I feel like it'd be more of a weight issue. Yeah, there's like 20 tons of Spartan and equipment in the back of this. Like, each Spartan's half a ton each, and then they've got a lot of guns and bullets. I think it's a little bit of a stretch, but anyway. They did mention somewhere along the line that everything on the Pillar of Autumn was being updated or upgraded for Operation Red Flag, and that it was all, like, custom shit. So this could be like a custom pelican that's just maybe a bit more than the seats pulled out of it. Yeah, it sounds, I think they say something about they took out the environmental systems in the bulkhead behind the cockpit and all that. So that's why there's enough room. It's basically just a skeleton with armor plating on it. They launch them out of the Pillar of Autumn and they get like a longsword escort to reach. And then all of the long, is it longswords or broadswords before the listeners get angry with me? I think it's long, long longswords. It's long swords in this, they became broad sword, or they add broad swords later, isn't it? I think it's okay, so, yeah. I'm sure they'll be very nice and correct me on it. <laughs> they get an escort. All of those pilots get wiped out. I do like that one line where the Pelican pilots panicking about where are they, and they're just like, hang on, hang on, we're here, business is good today. And you're just like, that's a bit of an understatement. The shit's hitting the fan. The Pelican pilot decides the only way to make it to reach in time is to floor it. They're entering the atmosphere at stupid speeds. They're actually going so fast with the G-Force that the pilot's like, he radios Fred and says, oh, I've I've left the Pelican on autopilot because I'm about to pass out, which was probably for the best because about two seconds later, the front of the Pelican gets shot off. The Pelican is being chased into the atmosphere by a few uh, seraphs. Yes. The front gets hit. The Pelican goes into a spin. The Spartans try to reroute control, but they can't. So they manage to stop the spin, but they can't land the ship now. So they blow the door off the back and they go to plan B, which is the Halo 3 method, and they all jump out. It's the first time in all of history that it jumping out of a pelican has gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, to be fair, is this the first time that the people in the pelican may have got to the ground before the pelican? Or no, actually, no. No, Pelican crashed into a mountain or something. 
even in this, the pelicans still beat them to the ground. Their natural habitat on fire. <laughs> and exploding. The Spartans basically crash to the ground, I think. Fred takes out a couple of trees on his way down. He ends up fairly heavily injured and damages his armour. I think four Spartans die in the impact. Yeah, four die. They lose four outright. They cripple a few. They've got various broken bones. I think they've got two or three Spartans that are now immobile, so I assume it's broken legs. And they're all in a pretty sorry state by the time they land. I think they've got four or five rifles between them. And then they have to throw rocks at the Covenant. (laughs) Yep. This always makes me very confused about Halo 3's intro. Master Chief's just like, man, I'm fine. I'm uh, having a good time right now. All these Spartans are like, we're dying. (laughs) Chief had a big forerunner sled lump of metal that he used to come down on. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he lands on the door. Technically, he didn't do it by himself. He got help. These guys are going by themselves. They hit and they hit hard. When they get there, they have to go and secure the generator site. And they get to the generator site and it's been a massacre. They find these couple of marines wandering around. I think they said they're wandering around in circles and they all seem a bit out of it. And then they're like, oh, where's the rest of Charlie Company? And the the soldiers are like, this is Charlie Company. There's no one else left. Fred very quickly establishes that Charlie Company were left to mind the base. They went out to engage the Covenant and asked for air support, and someone in HICOM ordered a bombing run on the entire area, which takes out the Covenant and Charlie team. So these are the only guys left, so the Spartans have kind of arrived just in time. And then they get a phone call from Admiral Whitcomb, who doesn't make the best first impression. I was going to say that as well. He really, he's a badass, though. He's a great character. Arc. Like He really had a bad first impression at the start. And even Fred had a bad impression of him. But he seems to come around. He definitely comes off as he's going to be the idiot in charge who shouldn't be in charge. Yeah. He's doing stupid orders because it's Fred that cringes because Whitcomb identifies himself over the radio and he's like, oh, you've painted a target on yourself. And then Fred has this idea going because Whitcomb tells them to come and rescue him and his staff, and Fred's like, all right, fuck it, let's send someone to rescue him, bring him the fuck back here, because he can help us defend the the generators. He sends a team off to do that, and then the rest of them, Fred splits them up into a couple of teams, because in the next valley, they have a Covenant cruiser that's dropping off troops on a gravity lift, and they're preparing for the next invasion, so I think some go off to defend the generators, some go off to secure the exit route with the last of the Charlie Company guys, and Fred takes Kelly and Joshua, isn't it? Yeah. Joshua's our red shirt for this. The three of them decide that they're going to go and take out the cruiser. They conveniently have a couple of nukes that they found sent in as armament for Charlie Company, and they take them and have this really cool run across the battlefield in three captured banshees. And they chuck the nukes up the grav lift of the cruiser. It's a great image. Like, it's such a great image of, like, we can't set off these nukes here because the EMP will wipe out our Mac guns, the power generators that we need. So we can't afford that. So how do we use these nukes? Okay, we detonate them in a Covenant ship behind their shields. And then that will contain the blast. And it's just such an awesome sequence of the idea that, like, it paints a great image of, like, the thousands and thousands of Covenant troops on the ground, and that this isn't normal. Covenant have never really done this before, never built like a shanty town fucking city. Yeah. Tents and shit and breeding apparatus for the grunts, and they're like, holy fuck, like how do we fight these thousands and they just go on this fucking crazy Hail Mary run and fucking nuke them. The picture afterwards of just like the destruction of this cruiser blows up, crashes, wipes out thousands of Covenant, like, That's just so awesome. That's such a great intro to a book. Isn't it Deliver Hope, the Reach trailer, where the original Noble Six gets taken out? Because he essentially does the same thing, except he goes up the gravity lift with the nuke. Totally what I was thinking of as well, yeah. But he he does the exact same thing, so they do that. It explodes inside the shield and then basically turns the ship into, I think they call it a giant fragmentation grenade. It wipes out all the Covenant. Eventually, they still lose the generators. Oh, by the way, Josh 
I say he gets taken out in this his pilot or his banshee gets hit by the cruiser's weapons. The last they see of him is smoke coming out of his banshee and he drops down early. He would have been caught in the blast. Throughout this book, you can always tell which Spartans are going to die. <laughs> yeah, they're the ones we haven't heard of. The only time there's a... Hang on, I did make a list. There is one Spartan, and it's Will. He is the only Spartan that you expect to die in this book, and he doesn't. Yep. Spoilers, he dies in the follow-up. <laughs> I'm willing to give you that spoiler for now. He's the only time that they'd take one of the Spartan 2s and go, aha, tricked you. But yeah, they wipe out so many. Is that where we leave on the first one? They take out the ship, but they still lose the generators and then it cuts off. Yes. They kind of leave it on a note we are not entirely sure if they're going to survive, which after Fall of Reach and the Flood, where you constantly have Chief as the last Spartan, you're like, oh fuck, how are they all going to survive this? What do we think then? Awesome. Yay! <laughs> but also sad. So many Dead Spartan 2s so fast. Yeah, this book just kills most of them. Honestly. Yeah, there's five of our 22 gone pretty quickly. It's almost like oh, there's only one Spartan in our games. We need a reason why. Boom. This book. Kill him, kill him, kill him. Yeah, pretty much. And now in the future, we've got, oh fuck, we need more Spartan 2s. Uh, let go to the reject pile and bring a few back <laughs> they could have been a bit more generous with who they saved here it was a little too detailed they could have made it a lot more ambiguous oh are they dead hmm. yeah yeah they do leave a few outs down the line for a couple of spartans to have survived there are a few in underground facilities that could have made it they could bring a couple of them back if they really wanted to chances are they mostly did it jumps from this to section one, which is called Threshold, and it picks up with Chief at the end of Combat Evolved. I actually love this section. This was yeah, I love section. it too. It is really good. They get an awful lot done very quickly. It's kind of fun that they deal with the Johnson question straight away. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll run through this quick. We've got Chief on the longsword. He has Cortana with him. Cortana's getting a bit pissy that he keeps asking her to scan the area and she's like what do you expect to find he's like well we've got limited fuel limited air limited energy if you don't find something we're dead because we also don't have cryopods i'm going to starve to death yes she's just like all right fine then i suppose i'll look for something it's it's interesting in this book because like at this point i'm just like what is master chief gonna like get a couple hours of sleep i'm just waiting for it to happen it doesn't happen till way later but <laughs> it's just like man does this guy ever stop Poor old Chief's had the week from hell so far. It started off with thinking all of his friends are dead and finished with zombies. Yeah, it's not over yet. Nope, now he's trapped in a tin can with no supplies. They're scanning and then they start to find a series of Covenant ships that are searching. And then Cortana, through some wizardry, hijacks the Covenant signals and happens to detect something ahead, which turns out to be cryopods. John goes on a little rescue and manages to reel those in with a very painful sounding scene where he stretches all of his joints. He goes into a little too much detail about John's shoulders and elbows popping yeah. as he tries to reach these cryo tubes. I wonder who's in the cryo tube. Yes, this will be important later that someone will come back. But he drags them in and reels them in, and then one of the Covenant ships is getting a little too close for comfort. And at the exact moment where they're probably going to get John, suddenly a pelican that Cortana thinks she spotted comes to the raid. They were hiding on a rock and they see all this going down. So they run distraction and the Covenant immediately go after the live target. They're chasing the pelican and then Chief tries to help them. So they set a course towards the Covenant flagship. Once they're in a line between the cruisers chasing them and the flagship, they have no choice but to stop firing on them. Chief and the Pelican, they do a slingshot maneuver around a planetoid. They hook up first, don't they? They they hook up before they do the slingshot. I think they hook up as they... Is it as they do the slingshot or just before? I think it's just before because they mention the fact that they're slingshotting and the two ships are under stress because it's not built for like 
the docking and the slingshotting at the same time. That's right. They dock together. They go to open the hatch. Guy sticks his hand in with a gun. Chief immediately freaks out, drags the guy through by the arm, slams the hatch shut, points the gun to his head. And then if you're listening to the audiobook version, this is when you get a really cheesy just Sergeant Johnson impression. Oren? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, the Johnson and the Chief impression is actually kind of mediocre throughout. You can tell that he's trying to kind of mimic the kind of uh, the voice actor from the games. He does like a fairly good stab at it, but his uh, Sergeant Johnson sounds a little bit like, I don't know, I can't quite put my finger on it. He uh, he has a conversation with Johnson, you know, you're dead, I saw you die. And Johnson basically says, no, no, the flood had completely ignored me. They didn't like me. They took everyone else. I survived. Chief backs down very quickly. He's like, all right. Oh, Cortana, Cortana does some scans and Cortana's the one who calms him down. Oh, true. Otherwise, he was going to murder this fool. Yeah, he was. I'm surprised he didn't murder him immediately. Like, if it had been me, I wouldn't have waited for an explanation. Because a little bit before this, when Chief's sort of sitting, he's having like minor freakouts about the flood. So he's like completely traumatized by this. At one point, he has the urge to like punch a bulkhead and he has to calm himself down. He's like, nah, the flood must have got to me more than I realized. So he's already on edge. And then this guy comes back from the dead. Johnson explains himself and that's fine. And then the rest of the crew come in from the Pelican. So we've got four total. So we've got Johnson. We've got Pulaski, the pilot. We've got Haverson, the Oni guy. And we have the other ODST, whose name I can't remember. Locklear? Locklear. He doesn't have a first name, isn't that right? I don't think so. Unless there's an introduction I didn't catch. No, even Halopedia had him only listed as Locklear. Ah, okay. Corporal Locklear, there it is. Locklear's a little bit uh, frazzled as well. He's got that long freaked out stir Pulaski is a co-worker of Fohammer so Chief expects great things from her and then Chief has no clue why Haverson the only guy's here Haverson knows a little too much because he seems to know what Chief's mission was and everything else and he knows who Chief is no I got total creepy bad guy only vibes off this guy at the start I mean this book has good ways of like setting up these characters to making you think they are a certain archetype, and they just totally don't turn out that way at all. Yeah, Locklear and Haverson kind of had the same yeah. first impression misdirection that, w- that Admiral Rickham had when he was introduced into the novel, and then as the novel kind of goes on, you kind of see more about him, and the team kind of comes together, and you, you, you kind of root for everybody. Yeah, I also love how um, they carried over the ODST Spartan beef. Yeah. from obviously. Now let's set that up in the first book, Fall of Reach. But they've carried it over here in terms of even in the flood, carried it over with Major Silva. Locklear is essentially one of his ODSTs. I like how that thread is at least carried through. Yeah, it it's a nice touch that this keep this going. And then actually it's a convenient touch that Johnson gets on with him then, because when they fill that out later, you're like, okay, this all can kind of like fit together. The crew come up with a very quick plan where they need a slip space drive. And Chief goes, well, we need a slip space drive. There's one out there. And he points to the flagship, whose name they still do not know. Quick point here. Is this, is this, this isn't Arbiter's ship, is it? I think so. I because, think it is. And I didn't think so. But later on, the prophet that we get, spoilers, hints at like of the, they never even say his name, but they say that like the commander who lost that ship, bring him before us and they'll be treated like blah, 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 blah. Which then reveals who that is. Yeah, he commanded multiple fleets, but most notably the fleet of particular justice. So Chief is about to fuck over his BFF for life, his uh, first alien buddy. It's not really fuck over, it's more like this sets them on the path to becoming besties. This is very true. We can look at it positively, yes. Uh, Positive destiny, alright, I like that. They come up with a plan to board the ship, which is... They have a mine launcher in the longsword, so they're going to stuff all the mines. They stuff them all in the pelican, don't they? And then launch the pelican at at the flagship. Just before you get too much further, Chief's plan is mental that he comes up with off the cuff. Like, this is the only possible thing we come up with, given the resources I have and where we are now. And he's like, we're going to do this. 
and like what he manages to do given like all the other books we've read and all the other things to do is fucking ridiculous when you think about like when we get what happens like it's like holy shit yeah like the the spartans were preparing for like weeks to do this mission and there were 30 of them and chief pulls it off with four randos and cortana yeah the best analogy I can think is just doing destiny with random people in matchmaking. We're going to do a raid. <laughs> I've picked four randos. Let's go. Don't bring your dirty destiny into our beautiful Halo universe. How dare you? I'll do what I like. <laughs> also, I don't know if they've mentioned it yet, but it is important throughout this book they mention that Cortana is, Cortana is fucked because of what happened on Halo. That like she absorbed so much information and is wasting so much of her resources analyzing it and like trying to understand it that like she's operating at such a reduced level of what she should be so i thought like, that's obviously set up halo 4 and even like what happens in halo, in halo 3 like all the all the things that happened to her i like that they set it up this early i thought that was cool i mean there's a whole scene later in the book that pretty much echoes her demise in halo 4 a hundred percent yeah yeah that's very true. They're, they they do start it off with she's a bit touchy and a bit like snappy with Chief, and then it just starts to get worse and worse. So they pack the Pelican full of mines. They launch the Pelican at the capital ship as a fire ship. At this stage, things get a bit complicated for me with the audiobook because from here on, they continue to refer to the longsword as a Pelican. <laughs> I get very confused listening to this. It turns out they mentioned it in the trivia. It was changed in the 2010 edition, but I couldn't figure out why they were on the Pelican when the Pelican was blown up. <laughs> Jesus. They were in Chief's Longsword. Yeah. They end up boarding the ship through one of the engineering bays. Oh, fun fact. In the original version, hang on, I have it here in the trivia. Uh, I'll mention it now. They quote the speed that the Longsword enters the ship as 300 meters per second, which is oh, 671 miles per hour. And they do a sudden stop from that speed, which, as it says in Halopedia, basically would have turned everyone to mush, including Master Chief. Perfect. Nice. This fudged the numbers a little bit. Yes, it's updated in the 2010 version to 30 meters per second, so I like to think it was a typo. Yeah, yeah, maybe just add the extra zero in. I mean, it's a cool maneuver, and it sets up uh, Podolsky as, like, this incredible pilot, and we've seen that at the start when she was, like, in her pelican, not crashing it. <laughs> flying really amazingly through the debris and dodging Covenant and stuff and then they give her control over this over Cortana because she's like you, but the pilot's no natural instincts or whatever is, is what's required because Cortana has to focus on immediately hacking the Covenant ship as soon as she gets close enough to it they need Cortana hacking the pilot flying and the fire ship I guess is just a distraction essentially I can't remember what it does does it actually do anything I can't remember other than blow up. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it just serves as the distraction. I like how your um, criteria for a good pilot is just not crashing the Pelican. <laughs> <laughs> if it didn't crash, you were you were a great pilot. Yeah, and they even make a comment about like how she's sad that she like you're about to blow up her Pelican. That was perfectly fine a moment ago. It's mental. They managed to do it. Just like that, and they get onto this massive ship, and then essentially fucking, you're ready to go through it, like, but just fucking take it over. They do a lot of stuff here. They board the ship, they take en the engineering area, or they like the bay, and then they get Cortana into the system. And she can do some things, but she can't take control of everything until she gets to the bridge. And then they go through some of the, they go through some of the engineer ducts and start to like move their way through the ship and then well the engineers are huge so it's fine <laughs> yeah absolutely let's see i'm trying to remember this off the top of my head do they vent the ship before they get to the bridge or after they they vent it after and it's not all of it it's only some of it because she doesn't have full control but like the numbers are crazy there's like only 100 elites i remember chief going only 100 because they say the ship is massive. It's got 100 elites, like a battalion or something, or company strength of grunts, and 3,000 engineers. I was like, what the fuck? Well, they just reproduce, like, constantly if you want them to, so... But there's, like, four engineers in all of Halo right now. 
true. They describe the ship as like the it's like the command ship. Yeah. I assume this is where when the prophet would have come to visit the Halo, this would have been his command center. I assume that's he would operate from here, and that's why it's like yeah. low crude. I guess so, unless maybe all the all the troops were deployed on Halo, I guess, or but like it just seemed mad. Yeah, it is a weird ship. It's the only thing that sort of works in their favor. They go up and they end up taking the bridge, but Chief has a like a arm wrestling competition with an elite and an energy sword. He just about wins that one. That fight's cool. There is a there's a lot of like back and forth in that where Chief sort of realizes I either need to like take this guy out or I'm fucked because there's no in between. We are just evenly matched. He gets his shields does he, he gets his shields damaged in the middle of this, doesn't he? His shields get knocked out somewhere along the line, yeah. I can't remember exactly where. Maybe someone hits him with an overcharged plasma. But they do eventually manage to take the bridge. They vent most of the ship and then they go to slip space out and realize that they physically disconnected the slip drive, slip space drive from the computer. Then Chief has to go and take an engineer to engineering to get it reconnected so that they can escape. Am I remembering this right? Yeah, pretty much. And and in this stage is where Cortana realizes she's fighting a Covenant AI, which is unusual. So like, there's like a back and forth there of what Cortana is doing and fighting this AI, and there's a bit of a, even a conversation between them a little bit. It's kind of all fucked up. There's some cool like scenes of like them fighting elites and murdering them and various other fun times. Yeah, one of the other things that I think Chief takes the engineer first. They fix the slip space drive. Cortana's defending the ship. The engineers repair the drive, and then they jump away. Then Cortana has one of the engineers repair Chief's armor, which Cortana thinks is a good thing. And then Haverson immediately realizes the flaw in the plan, and he takes action and executes the engineer. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone goes, why the hell did you do that? And then Haverson has to explain and go, the Covenant aren't, they're not inventive. They're, what is the phrase he uses? They're imitative. Imitative. So we took Covenant shields and we made them better. And the Covenant would then take those shields and implement them. And suddenly you would have elites and soldiers with Spartan great shielding because the Spartan shielding is superior to the personal shields of the Covenant. So he's like, we had to like kill this engineer. And then Cortana realizes, fuck, I should have figured this out. And I didn't. And I must be more broken than I realize. Yeah. And there's also the bit, you kind of skimmed a bit, like before they repaired the ship's place shields, that's a big moment where like, where they're on the bridge fighting Salih, all the other Covenant ships then turn against that ship. Before, like, let's say there's only like six humans on this ship and all the other Covenant ships turn around and go, we're now blowing this fucker up. Do you know what I mean? They take, they make no effort to take the ship back. That's right. Because that's the moment Cortana realizes that the AI sabotaged the plasma weapons. Yeah, and that, now she has to hide. So, like, they they fly in too near the gas giant and she fucks that up because Podolsky, the pilot, is like, you're doing this wrong and, like, you're going to fuck it up. And then Cortana realized, okay, yeah, I fucked it up. We're going to get dragged into this gas giant and crushed. That's right. I forgot all about that. Cortana does this crazy thing where she figures out how to use the slip space engines of the Covenant ship and better than the Covenant can. And then she manages it and then the Covenant AI sees her does it and calls out heresy and then runs away. And then she realizes, holy shit, like he was watching me and then she also makes a comment that they're imitative. Holy shit, have I just shown the Covenant how to slip space better? That would be a huge mistake. I remember like that being like a significant thing on her on her mind as well. Yeah, this the Covenant AI is like the pretty slipperiest and like sneakiest I think Covenant AI we really get to know uh, that was on the the Ascendant Justice. I was looking this up for our, our AI discussion or our lore podcast and like the origins of this AI is very weird where Cortana theorizes that it's potentially a human AI reverse engineered and like yeah. it's like a, a crazy copy of a copy of a copy. She's like, why would the Covenant do that? It doesn't make any sense to do this. So like this is really interesting and it's like a thread that's never they've never gone back to. I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, there's a there is a background here with this AI. Yeah. So they've slip spaced out of the planet's atmosphere, which is something the Covenant can't do. 
and then we get a flashback to Earth. Who remembers all the details of this? Because I don't remember it uh, 100%. Is this the... um? This is like the Council Oni meeting with, with Admiral Hood and Parangoski. Uh, is Parangoski there? Actually, no, she's not there. She, no, she's not there. So this is a cool... Di- I can't remember the guy's name, but it's told through the point of view of a pi- uh, some Oni operative. He was watching the events of Reach unfold and uh, like he was away just observing it. Lieutenant Wagner. Yeah, Wagner. He was uh, observing the Covenant fleet uh, attack Reach, essentially, and the defense. Obviously, he was there to report and assess. He's reporting back now on Earth in Sydney. Lord Hood is there. You have Colonel Ackerson there, who is one of the Sony section heads. Uh, he's the, the bad guy, quote unquote, and, and only who's like against Catherine Halsey and pretty much steals all her stuff. And he's the dickhead anyway. You, there's a bit of back and forth in the other books about him and between him and Cortana and stuff and, and, and Halsey. He's like an idiot. Like he's just the, he's just the guy you're made to hate. And then it just kind of like Hood is just like the nice man who like supports Spartans and all that kind of stuff. So you have the colonel saying that, like, oh, yeah, I watched Reed fall. This is what happened. And Ackerson is, like, very contradictive of him. He doesn't like what he said. doesn't like the report he's getting and stuff like that and the information being given about did the Pillar of Autumn get away? Are they on their mission? He says, like, he believes so. But then all the Spartans, he's, they just reckon, oh, Reach has been glassed. Reach is fucked. There's nobody alive on Reach. Not a hope is anyone alive. Reach is dead. Because this guy volunteers to go back and have a look and see what's left. Oh, yes, that he's such an asshole in that whole conversation. You're just like, ugh. Oh, I, for, I, I don't know how I forgot about that because I'm really angry when I read that whole thing. It's just like, oh, Cortana should have just had you executed. Yeah. Granted, he like makes some useful decisions, but still, don't like him. We go from this and then we bounce to section two, which is defense and castle base. So we're now back and we find out Fred and Kelly are still alive. There are still people alive on for Reach. Now. Yes, for now. They make their next move, which is they hijack some wraiths, and they start to kill a lot of Covenant with the wraiths, and they make their way back to the Spartans in the fallback position. Uh, Will, Isaac, and... How do we pronounce his name? Vin. I think it's just Vin with a silent H. Okay, I'll go, I'll go with that. So they descend down into the underground facility and they're at the big locked door and they're like no one's been answering from the inside there's an active comm signal it turns out halsey was sitting on the other side screening the fucking call (laughs) (laughs) wouldn't open it for them until they're like maybe you're not telling them what they want to hear and you're like her spartans were outside the fact she ignored them until one of them gave the magic tune ali ali oxen free (laughs) yeah Halsey then goes into repair mode and she starts to like heal up the Spartans because they're all in quite bad shape, some worse than others. Yeah, she starts like diagnosing all five of them like in her lab. Like I'm just like picturing the the, the like vastness of this lab that has all this medical equipment that can care for five Spartans and repair their armor and upgrade. They're also like upgrading their armor and their like glove reactions and she has a little like laboratory of trinkets <laughs> yeah they all get an upgrade she has a lot of testing equipment it's like i have all this armor that was due to go for field testing but we'll give it to you and i have all these weapons that was due to go to field testing but i'll give it to you very convenient she also tries to figure out what ackerson was up to she finds ackerson's ai and she murders ackerson's ai yep she completely, like, tears him apart. And he's like, wait, what are you doing? I don't recognize that. And he's like, oh, I'm dead now. Although I I like that the one thing that this scene makes you think is that AI see through their hologram because it talks about the AI leaning over her shoulder. And I'm like, that's not how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's supposed to be symbolic, but yeah. Who's got time for symbolism when she's deleting you? There's a time and a place. <laughs> He's just, he's just like Ackerson. He's an asshole. Yeah, they are like two well-matched assholes. You imagine it's a little bit like Pokemon where you go to pick your AI and you just get one that goes, I like you. And he really did pick a good one here. I love how they, uh, they describe the kill switch as like it's a physical 
thing, like an intense UV burst that destroys the memory crystal. I'm like, that sounds so cool. So it's like, how would you kill an AI? Which is an interesting question in today's world. And now he's dead. Yay! Yay! Screw you, Ackerson. What an asshole. He didn't kidnap children. He just lied to them. He lied to them. Suicide bombers out of them. He was like, you should come fight the Covenant. It'll be amazing. And then they're like, oh no, we're dead. <laughs> it's a quick section anyway, when they're in Castle Base. It kind of, it goes through really fast. I don't think any crazy significant happens here. But uh, Halsey has the crystal already, right? Yeah. Yeah, she has it. Okay. And this is the crystal from Fall of Reach, isn't it? Oh, no, not that crystal. That crystal is found way later. They don't discover the crystal till after they leave the base because they're in the base and then the the Covenant start attacking and bombing like the top of the mountain. And then that has them retreat deeper into the mountain. They have like mines. Yeah, there's there's mines. What was it? There's magma veins or magma tunnels. They use those to make the mines, they make the base out of the mines, and then they find out that there's actually the level below the mines, which is what they get down into. And then they find the super time-bendy room. They do. Very conveniently, she happens to be fixing Fred's glove at the exact right moment that he needs to touch the wall so it can take a DNA sample that he's human. <laughs> Which is pretty cool, like, the the way he discovers this passageway and how it lights up and, and all that kind of stuff. I got a lot of, like, Halo 4 Requiem vibes. Oh, yeah. Man, I must have been really tired when I read this section. I have no memory of this. <laughs> well, there's a bunch of glyphs, and he's like, these glyphs are weird. Yeah, like, as he touches everything, it, it's like this luminescent vibrance that kind of brings him to his pe- the path to where they discover this this chasm. Yeah, he describes like a pinprick sensation on his fingers and then it all lights up. So I assume it like samples him because he wasn't in his armor or he didn't have his full armor on. They get to the big room and it's a very big room. It feels like outdoors and they can see the crystal in the middle. But when they try to walk to the crystal, they end up walking in a circle around the crystal because it's bending gravity. They end up having to get Linda to like side up on it and walk them to it uh, while the rest of them close their eyes and follow like hand on shoulder. And then they get the crystal, they realize it's weird, and then immediately the covenant break <laughs> through the ceiling and start to come in. <laughs> yeah, like like the moment. They get... <laughs> and the covenant aren't firing back on them, so they realize they have to defend themselves. But then there's thousands of covenant on all the balconies two hunters try to shoot them and then they miss thankfully well they hit them oh no they hit kelly that's not here right this is because chief comes in now and saves them well i guess it cuts i i think it i think the the chapter ends with the hunters firing and then it then it does cut to chief and then the timelines kind of sync up yeah they go together from there because i think the last thing in this is the hunters fire and then all of the other Covenant fire, and it cuts, and then you go, oh fuck, they're about to kill them all, and then it joins back with Chief at that exact moment. The next one is Section 3, and that's Rescue, and in this section, the crew of the Ascended Justice, they arrive at Reach, and they're like, hmm, we need to figure out what we're going to do now, and then they pick up this faint distress signal, and Chief's like, yep, there's people alive on Reach. My friends are there. The Spartans well, are there. Well, it's the Ali uh, Ali Oxen Free. It, that's what it is. It's the Ali Ali Oxen Free tone. So they have to plan how they're going to get there. And they're also observing the Covenant doing some weird shit because, oh no, hang on. Do we have the, we have the flashback here, don't we? Yeah, basically while, while Cortana is like doing her calculations, it cut, it, we have a chapter flashback of kind of, not necessarily the origin of Ali Oxen Free, but just a use of Ali Ali Oxen Free, and to kind of just tell the reader that what it is. And so there's, it's just like a flashback where they invade, like when the Spartans were kids, or like 12 years old, and they invade this tango company to steal, you know, capture the flag. Yeah, they're doing like a really vicious capture the flag where tango company have already beat the shit out of one of the kids in a previous mission. And they're now out for blood, basically. They've got their pride to play for, and they lose. Krista, Krista was that in your book? Because I don't remember that at all. I wonder if that's an audiobook thing. 
No, it was in the 2010 version. Definitely? Yeah. 100%. It's it's quite brilliant. I I'm a, I actually got the 2019 version. If you have the book, it's chapter 17. It's quite brilliant, actually. It's a really good uh, little kind of story. I like when they use the mirrors. That was my favorite part. <laughs> that's nuts. To like think about how they had to do that, That that's just nuts to me. <laughs> They're smarter than I am, that's for sure. Yeah. The gist of it is that they they have to infiltrate this base, and so they get underneath like a, not a warthog, but some sort of like large it's vehicle. It's a delivery truck of some sort. They are hiding like in the axles. And and so they have mirrors because at military bases, there's like these wheels, these mirrors on wheels so they can look under the car to see if there's like people or explosives. And so each Spartan has their own sh- uh, mirror to kind of reflect a different part of the undercarriage back into the mirror so then the, M- the MPs don't notice. And then once they get in, they just have like, Dart, like tranquilizer darts and just like go to town steal the flag and go back to a rendezvous point and they also uh, manage to poison the sniffer dog so they don't get caught they like feed them a load of berries and stuff and like bad squirrels so that they all have diarrhea that's how they like get around it chief has his flashback and then we snap back to where we are chief convinces them that they have to go planet side cortana catches the ai and strips him down and finds out uh, is it here that she finds out there's hints of like human ai in it i think so because she she destroys it so i don't know what other trace of it she decompiles it so she like sort of looks at the code as she strips it down and she stores it for archive but she sees that bits of it look sort of similar to herself and she starts theorizing that it might be like partly human this is so brushed off, too. It's just like a throwaway couple of lines, and then the whole like story just moves forward. They're like, yeah, we just dropped that. Let's keep going. Yeah, I want to know where, where this AI, AI came from, or what is it? Because we know the Covenant don't use a lot of AIs, but they have this, and I want to know what they did or where they got it. But the crew go planet side. Chief and co. fly to the Ali Ali Oxen free thing. They land in a canyon, and they meet... I think it's Lee and Anton, or is it just Lee on his own? It's Lee, Anton, and Grace. It's all three of them with Admiral Wickham. Yeah, they take them to the cave and they're like, here's here's Admiral Wickham. And I think Admiral Wickham fills them in on what the plan was. And he's telling them all about the... The nukes. What are the big bombs called? The yeah, Havoc what nukes. Are, they, are, they, are they Havoc nukes or are they something bigger? I thought they were Havocs. These are the planet busters that he came up with their feature in the in the next book. His he stayed behind to like arm the nukes and hope that the Covenant took them back to somewhere important and blew themselves up. So Haverson's there and he's like, Yeah, yeah, this this all sounds like a good plan. So you like you programmed them for ten days, didn't you? He's like, Nah, I give them seven. I didn't want them to take too long. And they're like, Um, how long's left on the timer? And Wickham's like, ah, about twenty hours. And everyone's like, um, we might need to get a move on here. Let's see, where do we go from here? The rescue operation, pretty much. Yes, they fly to Castle Base because Chief says that there's a chance that they're still alive under there. He thinks they're under there, and Whitcomb, being the big softy that he is, says, we can't leave a man behind unless you're Noble Six, because they left him to die. So they decide to go and rescue them. They fly to the dig site, and they find the gravity lift descending down through the hole in the ground and they fly the dropship down it and when they get out at the bottom they come out in the big crystal room and then they reinforce Fred and Halsey and the rest of the Spartans and then we get back to the moment when the Covenant fire with the Hunters except the Covenant actually fire on the Hunters and vaporize them. I think there's like a there's a covenant translation where it's like the next person to fire on them, I'm gonna skin them alive, capture them and get the crystal. So the covenant want the crystal at all costs, and they're actually prepared to take massive losses and not fire back on the Spartans. I think the team hold their own for a little bit. Do they they fall back to a tunnel and blow it up? Do we get split in two here? How does this go? I think the dropship just comes in and picks them up. 
But they also blow a tunnel and they lose two Spartans in the process, don't they? Or did that happen? That must have happened before they got here, before they got to this room. Yeah, because they lose... Vin and Will? Yeah. Vin and Will, because they get, I think after they get the crystal, they, they kind of they then go deeper into the chamber. And Kelly, Halsey, and Fred go out of the door, and Fred has to blow the door to, in order to escape. And he, like, makes this moment where, he, you know, Will and Vin are still inside. They could be alive. They could already be dead, but he has to protect this crystal. And so he blows the door. They run away. And so Will and and Vin are presumed killed in the chasm. Right. And then they, the crew get back to the dropship. And then the plan is let's go back up the chute up against the gravity lift. So they're heading up the tunnel and then the Covenant crank up the down on the gravity lift and they start to push the dropship back down towards the chamber. Whitcomb sends Lee out onto the hull, is it? And he's like, fire, fire a rocket up this tube and see what happens. I think he turns around to someone in the cab and he says, like, it's probably not going to reach, but we have to give it a go. But as soon as they open the door and, like, the intense light from the gravity lift comes into the crew cab, the crystal splits open and immediately nullifies the gravity. I think that they get, like, a surge of radiation from it, but then it suddenly stops and the dropship immediately starts to shoot back up the passage and out. And, of course, no one will shoot on them because they have the crystal, so they're safe to fly out, but they're being pursued by all of the Covenant, and they're going to the rendezvous position, where hopefully Cortana's going to be waiting for them. Because I think when all this happens, Cortana, she's had to slip space out into the Oort Cloud with Ascendant Justice, and then she comes up with her plan. Yeah, she had to jump out of like planet, planet area, and then recharge her slip space to then go to a very specific rendezvous point, which is basically a blind spot of the Covenant's, like, circumnavigation as they're looking around the planet, because they're in these, like, they're, they're in these very specific orbits she calculates. Well, this is when she uh, also attaches to Gettysburg. Well, just before that, I think, because then after, after she gets close to the time, then I think she goes and then jumps to the Gettysburg and then goes to the rendezvous point right because isn't the gettysburg on reach she does some crazy maneuvering and then ends up ends up attaching the gettysburg to get the extra slip space power and then goes to the guys and they're like let's head off yeah i think the plan is she's out on the edge of the system she detects the covenant transmissions from earlier she realizes the covenant have the coordinates to earth so she's got to come up with a plan so she jumps back into the graveyard of ships above reach and finds the Gettysburg, attaches them together because she needs to do like an instant slip space jump once she rescues Blue Team. She basically needs to do like two back to back. She needs to slip space to them and then slip space out. And the only way to do it is to have two sets of reactors so that when she uses the Covenant slip space drive, she can then charge it from the human ship. So we then get the hybrid Gettysburg Ascended Justice. Which just sounds so mental the entire time I read this book. Yep. Well, she also was saying on how, like, their two reactor couplings or whatever are, like, not compatible. So she had to essentially tell the ships to, uh, like, readjust themselves so then they can... She sent engineers out. Engineers went out and retrofit it. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, the en- Yeah, she uses the engineers on Ascent and Justice. All and- 3,000 of them. <laughs> she uses a lot of engineers in this, where she's like, I need to do something physical. Engineers, they're my slaves now. So she gets them to do that, and then she escapes with the crew, and everything is fine. Nothing goes wrong whatsoever. Perfect. Book is over, and everyone lives happily ever after. Now we go to section four, happy ending. Yay. <laughs> Fucked slip space. That's very confusing. Section 4, Gambit. The ship jumps to slip space, but then immediately they find out they ain't in slip space. Well, not the slip space we're used to. We're actually in a really weird distorted area of space. It's like a bigger slip space butter bubble. When they jump into slip space, all these Covenant ships are able to follow them, which is usually not a thing. Yeah, it's like a weird funky bubble, and the Covenant ships try to fire on Cortana, so Cortana fires back, and then they immediately find out that nothing goes the direction you think it's gonna go. 
there's like a bunch of gravity distortions, which is kind of hilarious because like they keep firing plasma at each other and like the plasma just keeps like arcing and going all crazy, like hitting their friends. Bouncing off like, slip space bubbles and stuff. It's just chaotic. All this slip space stuff is so confusing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like it's all over the place and the ships are being torn apart. And then Whitcomb decides, right, the answer is we've got to get out of here. So we're going to charge our way through the Covenant ships and just run them all over. And then immediately the engines break. So at first they think they took a plasma round. Then they find out it was actually sabotage. But what they send a team out. So Pulaski, it's everyone, isn't it? All go out onto the hull. Most, of, yeah, all the Spartans and Pulaski. Kelly's injured, but it's all the other Spartans. Which is Fred, Fred, Will, Anton, and Grace. And Linda's still in her cryopod right now. Yeah, Linda's still in cryo, technically dead, and Kelly's in critical condition from the Hunter Blast. And Pulaski volunteers to fly them out in the dropship to get them there quicker. They take all their gear, they go out onto the hull, they go to do repairs, the Covenant come out and attack them because some of the crew are still on board, and then... Anton, Lee, and Pulaski are on the dropship when it gets taken out by one of these spirally plasma sh- blasts that like appears out of nowhere and melts the ship, and the three of them are gone. It murders everybody. Well, and then everyone else is like sleepy. They go to bed. They're almost out of it. I think Chief just has enough time to like latch everyone to the hull before he passes out, and then they charge out of this funky area yeah slip space they destroy the other ships and then they come out of the weird funky slip space and then they're like we're two weeks in the past wow (laughs) yeah we have no idea where we are either then this leads us into section five which is massacre at eridanus does someone want to take us through the eridanus thing for a second sure i love this because i love eridanus i love this place that we keep going back to in various books, and I, I would love to see it someday, uh, even though it's gone now. <laughs> Essentially, like, they come out of space, their ship is fucked. Their ship is double fucked. It's just in bits, nothing's working, they lost a bunch of plasma turrets. Cortana is like, shit, what are we going to do? They have to come up with a plan. They scan at extreme range, and eventually Chief is brought back on board. He wakes up, he realises the Spartans are dead, Pulaski's dead. Who went out with him? I think Fred and someone else survived, and they're they fucked up. Will I think Will still? Yeah, Will, Will, Grace, and Fred and Chief survive. Survive. So they come brought back on ship. They got a bit of aid. This is probably the first time Chief has any kind of sleep in like crazy amount of time since Halo CE. And there's also the guys are like, "What are we going to do?" They scan. They realize we're only within range of so many two or three planets. One of them is like an old ex uh, human colony that's definitely got Covenant on it. And then Chief realizes, well, one of the planets we're in range of is somewhere I've been before. We should definitely go there. There's humans, they'll help us. Is Eridanus Chief's homeworld? Am I misremembering? It is. Eridanus 4, I think. Yeah, is, is Chief's homeworld. But he never, he, uh, he barely really mentions it. Uh, this is actually the home of a rebel base that's inside an asteroid that we go to in the Fall of Reach. They fuck up. They There's a good callback that's coming to, up to later on. Uh, Halsey also reveals kind of how Johnson survived the Flood. Uh, he has a unique syndrome that kind of messes up his nervous system, so when the Flood tried to take over your nervous system, they couldn't take over his, and that pretty much made him immune, even though it did try and infect him, and he has Flood DNA in him that's somehow giving him regenerative properties, but they never touch on that ever again. I- didn't like that part. Yeah, I was like, whatever. This doesn't really... But they needed an excuse, but they didn't have to layer it on so thick, especially not since, like, he dies, like, one game from now. Yeah, and this is this is what leads to the he's actually a Spartan 1 thing. Yeah, I think that must have been retroactively added back in. Yeah, they, they add that in later, but I don't buy it that Halsey never knew. Yeah. That he wasn't a Spartan 1, yeah. Halsey knows everything. I'm getting the impression that, well, I'm obviously backfilling that she was simply not telling John that information, but giving him a story to believe, as opposed to like her actually not knowing that he was a Spartan one, but whatever. 
We get a really weird scene that I wasn't mad about where Admiral Whitcomb just totally bluffs his way onto the... Um, like, he's, re- he's really shitty to these uh, to the rebels. Yeah, he's pretty dominating. Yeah, he's, like, playing up the worst aspects of the UNSC to the rebels. And I, to kind of, I don't know why, but essentially bluff his way in because their ship is screwed. They only have one, not one plasma shot. So he, like, blows up an asteroid that's the same size as their base to kind of convince them to let us in. They kind of fake in having, like, nukes around this kind of ship and... There's kind of a few points made about like the types of ships that the rebels have. They shouldn't have these ships. and uh, They should be decommissioned, blah, blah, blah. There's a super secret special ship over there that's going to be important later because we talk a lot about it. So they're like, all right, okay. Pretty much what are we going to do? The Covenant show up behind them. They catch up to them. The Gettysburg. Is it this where it pushes a rock into it? Is that how they kill this one? I can't remember. They They fight it out here with this Covenant ship and I think they push an asteroid into it which is kind of cool from this debris field. And then they pretty much make up friends with the governor. His describes Governor Giles. They go over and they meet him. There's some interesting kind of kind of coming back of the Spartans coming back to this base for after like 20 years ago. They were they attacked it and got Colonel Watts and extracted him out. They feel kind of weird. One thing I always loved and I did touch upon it in Hillary Street, like John seriously regrets his actions of blowing the airlock and like murdering a whole lot of innocents um and he really regrets that decision and i like that that shows you know his character growing from just being a murdering machine to being somewhat thinking about innocence you know good guy john yeah yeah he like he like it like touches on it to where he he can't take like human lives anymore because everyone's human against this covenant threat yeah he sees like this is the, the greater threat is here I think it's at this stage Halsey has already given John the two reports and told him you can either kill Sergeant Johnson or not in terms of what you report back to Oni in terms of the flood yeah. data. So John's mulling that over as well in terms of what's the greater good, sacrifice Johnson for a one in a billion shot of finding a cure for flood or whatever. So that's playing on John's mind throughout a lot of the sections of his book. There's a bit of touch and base where like they, they're repairing their ships, they're like trying to evacuate don't really, they're, not, they're very unclear about what happens to this base, uh, essentially, of... They kind of just kind of peace out, don't they? Yeah, the base is fine when they do the repairs, and, and basically Governor Giles and his crew are doing the repairs, and then that's when Halsey does her... Switcheroo, yeah. So she, like, pretty much steals Kelly, knocks her out, takes a bunch of shit, and robs this super old stealth ship that um the Rebels have. And then, like, gives this, like, here's this dangerous radiation crystal. You can take it. You're clearly mentally unstable right now. Yeah, which is another segment I I, I didn't like. What, what, the conclusion of this, essentially. So she gives him this and pretty much says in so many words, don't let Oni take this. Be, you know, it can't risk falling into the hands of the Covenant. Every time you go into the place with this, it sends out a massive radiation burst. They can track it. They'll follow you. They know where it is. So you have to deal with the situation because Haldi doesn't want to deal with it. So she's leaving it with you. And guess what he does? He does the responsible thing and murders himself. And doesn't even destroy the crystal. Haldi takes Kelly and fucks off out and that's the end of that story. And that picks up that picks up and goes to Vonix. Yeah, yeah. So she's gone from the story with Kelly. Then you cut back to... Like the bridge. Governor Giles is like, Admiral, why did you steal my ship? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, hold on, I'm trying to find out who stole the goddamn ship. And Halsey sends him some message that really pisses him off. I thought that was funny. Then she's pretty much gone, and then she has a slipstate drive, and it's all about Whitcomb and Harrison going, you told me that ship was locked down, no one could use a slipstate drive on that thing. Why it wasn't physically removed, I don't know. They put some kind of password-protected slipstate drive, and Cortana figured it out. Halsey? Cortana didn't do it, did she? Oh no, Cortana did it because there's a shit ton of Halsey erasing Cortana's memories left, right, and fucking center. Cortana's already fucked and whole Halsey just like messes with her this entire time. Like, I'm deleting everything you ever loved from your memory. <laughs> but she makes it sound like she's doing her a favor, like she's giving her back percentage on runtime so that she can live a little bit longer. But then she asks Cortana to do shit and then she's like, yeah, you're not going to remember that. Yeah, I thought it was funny. So 
It was it was a comment that Harrison made that oh like not even Cortana could break that and Halsey's like oh I bet she could which is what made me think that it was actually Halsey and Cortana together like reactivated slips and stride in the ship anyway slips face out Admiral's pissed off because he's like we could have used that and gone back to Earth what the fuck anyway we're stuck here now oh shit two more Covenant cruisers show up we got a bail and then pretty much all of the governor's people get off the Senate Justice and Whitcomb was like we can barely fight we got one shot weighing up my pros and cons yeah i'm gonna sacrifice all these people we're getting the fuck out so he slips space out and that's a big learning point for john learns this and sees what happened like how this admiral makes this decision that we have to get back to earth we have to save them they know the plan now that the covenant are amassing and going to fight they need to get back to earth they have so much information they're so valuable they cannot risk this fight they can't win everybody's gonna die if we fight or only they'll die if we run so fuck it we run that's pretty much where that goes. Loxair blows up the crystal, but like literally throws it like a few centimeters away from himself and goes, oh yeah, that'll blow up. It's like totally he just fine. threw it away in the waste bin and started like walking away and, and like hid behind the neighboring chair. <laughs> he made no effort to survive. He pretty much just committed suicide. There you go. We didn't get into section six, which is Operation First Strike. We're like 31 chapters in and we're finally doing the namesake of the book. Yeah. So I think Chief had come up with a plan of what he wanted to do, but didn't get a chance to enact it because the Covenant showed up straight away. So his plan is essentially to make the first strike. There's a good line in the book where he actually says we're going to make the first And then first the credits strike. roll. It was really awkward to read the credits for a book. <laughs> this, is <what> it- <laughs> this is cool anyway. So the- I don't know if anyone else wants to pick up. Orin. Yeah, I'll pick it up. So yeah, essentially they're all in their own slip space. They're they're doing the thing. They realize what happened down with Locklear and, and whatever level. And they're in like a boardroom or something or on the bridge. And John's like, you know, I have I want to pitch this. And like Whitcomb's already like kind of celebrating, pouring himself some some brandy. John says, this is the mission that we need to do. And at first, Wickham says, like, no, like, the information we have right now is just too valuable. We need to get it to Earth, like David mentioned. But after some sort of, like, logistic sort of talk, they convince Wickham. And essentially, the Spartans are going to peel off to go to the unyielding Hierophant. Which Johnson keeps joking around as like an elephant, which is great. <laughs> it honestly, like when I first read this book, it fucked me up because I literally thought it was called elephant for the longest time because that's what my brain remembered for whatever reason. So I always thought it was like uneven elephant for the longest time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like they don't know they know an even elephant. Shout out to that. That was that's a pretty good joke that goes on throughout. But essentially, yeah, the plan that they learned is that they all the covenant is going to this unyielding hierophant refueling station where they get supplies they get things that they need reinforcements and it's it's their stop before they make the jump to where earth is in um i think it was warfleet or mythos they had an image of this have you guys seen it i have oh, not yeah. oh it's yeah. pretty strange looking it's a men- even to visualize it's mental it's like two, like i think sergeant johnson or someone, someone oh yeah says he says it's like, it's like two, two squids, squids kissing, kissing. It's literally like these kind of, it's like two ovals that have like a beam in the middle of them. That's what it looks like. Yeah, I just uh, pulled up a picture. Yeah, that's nuts. It's weird looking. So the, the all the Spartans, and so we have, um, Linda's been since revived. I don't know if we mentioned that. Halsey managed to bring her back. Yeah, they managed to bring her out of her cryotube and kind of re, you know, re, re, rebirth her or whatever. They brought her back just to make some of these banshee shots, and we'll talk about them later. That's the only reason they (laughs) brought her back. So they bring Linda back. John's still here. We still have Fred. And then we have Will and Grace. And so we have our five-person Spartan fire team. And they get out of slip space, and they kind of jump ship. They get on a a drop ship, and they fly toward Unyielding. They, They get in there, and they start you know, stealthily infiltrating. And Cortana makes a copy of herself. Yeah, that's an important that's thing. That's very that Cortana important. Cortana figures out it's actually a covenant code that allows her to make a copy of portions of herself. So she did that to kind of figure out how to, like, translate covenant stuff. But then she did it then to make a sh- shard of her, essentially, that a chief can take. 
because they need like codes and and system uh, schematics to kind of see the the engineering lines and to open doors and stuff like that. Yeah, they have a plan because Cortana has the plans for this already, or she knows what to do anyway before they get there. Like, we have to go into this place and I can start a chain of events that'll blow it up. Yeah, we have to go to this reactor and and basically blow it up. They go and they fly over there and they get intercepted by some other seraphs and uh, they get towed in to some sort of launch bay. They kind of get out. I think there's engineering engineers that greet them, so there's not like a big firefight, and uh, they just kind of let them do their thing so they don't raise an alarm. And then they go to this like passageway, and it's it's again like one of these cram spaces where they need to take their shields down so then their armor and stuff can go through, and they crawl for like eleven hours. I mean, considering how big this freaking station is, did we talk about the reactor yet? What they're doing exactly? I mean, uh, if you want to be more detailed than just kind of blowing it off for a chain of events, each side of each in one of the each of these ovals is in a reactor, and you, you, Cortana figures out you only need to set off one of the reactors, and the other one will just blow. So they're just heading to inside one of the big ovals to get to the reactor. Right. They go down uh, and they reach like another panel that was like welded shut that basically prevents them from continuing. That was, I guess, you know, added or something. That wasn't in Cortana's plan. So they, they kind of backtrack a little bit and they go and find this alternate route. But this new route is like through this open, not like courtyard, but it's, it's just like this atrium. open space. Yeah, an atrium. And with that, there's a whole bunch of threats that could be alerted. And so Chief's like, all right, we're just going to have to sprint and, and give it a go. And so I think, is, does Kelly post up for this? Linda Linda goes and posts. Linda posts up in her sniper position, and the other four Spartans sprint towards the reactor, and this is where they encounter brutes. Yeah, and I think, well, John smashes through a grunt on his way, which I thought was cool. He just mur- straight up murders a grunt, just just running Just for past. fun. Just for funsies. And then, like, immediately Grace gets murdered. Like, fucking straight away. I'm like, Jesus. Yeah. The brutes come in and just start laying pa- like fire. And is it like is it a spike grenade or a brute shot? Brute shots. I think it's brute shots that that kill because it, he makes the talks that they're shooting grenade launcher. It's a grenade launcher there. He's and so she just kind of just gets torn to pieces. Her insides are now her outsides. Did you guys pick up? The, it's, it's pretty much an ambush. The brutes have ambushed them, which means they know they were in the system and they tracked them via their their comm channel. So they know when the internal comm channel the Spartans used to talk to each other. That's what they're using to find out where they are. So, like, that's never really explained, right? I think Cortana was having trouble with the Covenant AIs on here, too. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's part is. of it. Cause that, and then I think that's why she continued to copy herself to try to jam all of the extra signals. And John also mentions it later on that the Covenant were triangulating, triangulating his comm channels when he reaches out to her. After they kind of have this skirmish... They need to acquire these banshees, and so John says to Linda, "Hey, don't confirm this, but I need you to take out those banshees. But we need them, so don't destroy them. You need to kill the pilots." Oh, it's so good. Which is like the best like sniper section in a novel in the whole series, to where she essentially shoots into the cockpit through this very narrow hole, and the bullet ricochets within the cockpit and just obliterates the elite flying it I and she does that three it. times she does it a lot a lot of times it's really cool and every time master chief's like no one in the world should be able to make that shot but she keeps doing it <laughs> <laughs> that's why linda is best girl his best girl so they pretty much get in and set off the reactor pretty quickly but i love the decision of like just blow it up right now fuck it we're good we're gonna make it out and she's like Get free and then tell me. I'll start the timer for 10 minutes. It takes 10 minutes. And they're just like, nope, do it right now. You're fucked up. Cortana's gone crazy. We need to get the hell out. Yeah, and kind of talking about what we alluded to earlier in the sh- in the episode. So yeah, Cortana just continually like splits herself. And I think they said there's like over 100 copies of this copy of Cortana. And that kind of mimics what happens at the end of Halo 4, where Cortana makes a lot of copies of herself to kind of slow down the didact and then ultimately kind of create this this shield to protect the nuke. At she the end pretty of the game. much goes rampant at this point too. So it kind yeah. of foreshadows that whole It really it's like almost echoing 
the very end of Halo 4 when she's doing it over and over and over again. There's just a million of her fighting the didact. So Cortana basically thinks herself and copies herself to death. They blow up the reactor. Chief goes and retrieves Linda, who's like strung up on... Is she like actually upside down or is she just like... She's suspended, yeah. It's it's messed up. It's crazy. On some ropes. So she can like stay hidden, but also get like a clear, a clear shot. She found a spot in between like the bright UV lights and the dark shadows of this huge atrium. And she's just hiding in that like narrow strip where like your eyes can't adjust to either light from far away. It's gorgeous. It's it's mwah, best girl. <laughs> it's magnificent. And she's holding the rifle in one arm. I thought that was also dope. I also love how they like get into the banshee together. <laughs> it's like, oh god, how did that work? They have to keep like the cockpit open. There was there's like a little notice, and it was like Chief like scooted over a little bit. I'm like, yeah, okay, Chief. <laughs> That's what those banshees on on the cover of uh, what is it, Fall of Reach, where the cockpits are open. Oh that's, yeah, that's just two Spartans are in there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So they all reconvene, they get in a drop ship, and they start flying towards the backside of a neighboring moon. And they're kind of, you know, taking a, a, a breath and they're looking at their comm signals and they're like, wow, Cortana's really like overloading everything. But they notice that there's one comm channel that's that doesn't have a lot of spikes in it. Well, it's doing Ali Ali Oxen Free again, isn't it? And it's another, it, yeah, it's another Ali Ali Oxen Free. And so they, they, chime it and i think it's haverson who answers it's wickholm but basically they said hey we're here come to the back side of the moon we have a second phase to your plan that we felt like doing beating the covenant to earth a couple hours earlier really wouldn't save us that much we're gonna do something else so chief and them get around to the gettysburg but they notice that it's only the gettysburg and not ascendant the kind of ascendant justice gettysburg hybrid ship and they step on, and it's only Johnson on board, Johnson and Cortana. And they look sad. Yeah, they're all they're all kind of sad. And then Johnson throws his jokes about the uh, uneven elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Every time kissing. it hits. And essentially, is like, what's going on? And so they hail Ascendant Justice, who's making its slingshot around the moon. And he's basically saying, we're going to decoy the Covenant to lure them to me so then they're all within the blast radius so we can take out the most ships as we can. Also, he has the crystal. Well, he has... He, no, he has a... Um, he had like a projection of the crystal. Yeah. I think he has like a, like a 3D hologram of the crystal and he kind of broadcasts that as a video feed to all, all open channels. And he's like, come and get it. You know, you covenant Earth's scum. Earth's best warriors are on the ship and all this kind of stuff because he's totally playing up the elite's bravado. And so everyone, all the ships kind of converge on him. He, they shoot some ships to kind of just do what they can. And then they, I think they crash like right into. They crash right into it. It's so cool. And so they kind of head into it. They do one last feed to Chief. They're all bloodied and kind of scarred. And he, he basically was like, remember the Alamo. <laughs> they, he talks about the Alamo a lot. <laughs> yeah. They always talk about like old earth like things all the time. Well, the the problem is like they can't talk about anything that happened not in the normal timeline because we won't relate to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it's like actually a pretty common like sci-fi trope where well they'll be talking about oh these great generals from the past and they'll go like George Washington. You know, you have George Washington, <laughs> uh Napoleon and then they'll just make up a name. And so yeah. it's like okay, well this this third name is within the realm of greatness of these other two names that w that you know we as humans know. If they only referenced you know people we don't know, we won't be able to contextualize like what kind of traits they think are desirable. If you throw George Washington in there, you're like, oh, okay, so it's kind of guys along that line. Yeah, and, and like when also another example in the book, I don't know if it's this one or another one, but whenever they talk about Deja and how they taught them strategies, they'll, they'll say like, Deja taught us about the Spartan battles at Thermopylae and then the human forces at some other planet within the Halo universe. So then you're like, okay, well then that that Earth battle contextualizes this other space battle. So then we know that they're the same. While he's um, talking about his Alamo stuff, there is a great image in the book of like, the thousands of like enemies that are like in space trying to cut their way into the ship. They're like coming and like drop pods and drop ships and stuff like that just to kind of 
burn in. I thought that was cool. Just the idea of this wave of just like elites out there in space. It was definitely a good analogy for a lot of parts of this book where it's like a handful of just a couple people be like keep away thousands and thousands of enemies. Yeah. And I mean, like if you look at that image from Halo War Fleets that I'm assuming it's the one that I have, but you have the unyielding Hierophant there, but then you also have like dozens of ships in this one image to kind of give you an idea of just how outrageous this fleet was. So anyway, so then they crash into the Hierophant and the reactor detonates, chain reaction, everything just kind of goes up into like a brilliant blue light. There was a like recon drone that like recorded everything that was like on the other side of the moon to kind of see it because Chief and the Gettysburg were on the far side, the dark side of the moon, so to speak. So after they retrieved the drone... Johnson comes up to Chief and he says, hey, Haverson gave me this Oni thing that you gave him, said that you would know what to do with it. <laughs> and Chief was like, oh, thank you. And this is where, again, he has that other kind of morality decision to kind of make which which chip does he actually give Oni. And he kind of reflects on Admiral Whitcomb's, you know, Alamo references in his final stand just now and decides to destroy the information that has all of Johnson's sort of files and, and information to where the remaining file that he would give to Oni on the flood just kind of has that, that, you know, slightly limited. Just doesn't have, like, Johnson's information. Yeah. I like the morality of this book where it's like, you know, you should save everyone you can because the one person one person might be able to, you know, turn the tide of the entire war. Or, you know, one person might make a huge difference. And then, and it also comes back to you know the needs. I think it's Star Trek where they where Spock says the needs of the many outweigh the needs, the needs of the few. Of the few. Yeah. And so, yeah, that that is uh, is a, a theme throughout the whole book. That's that's just really really great on how it's weighed together. Um, and then John basically I forget what his kind of last thought is, but after he crushes that, he basically says that he's just ready for whatever happens next, and you just smash to Halo Two. <laughs> Then we have the final section, um, Harbinger, Harbinger, and we're at High Charity, and we have the Prophet of Truth meeting with Tartarus, basically discusses you know, the rogue ascent and justice on how it kind of jumped around the galaxy, and eventually what happened with the unyielding Hierophant, and now they're headed to Earth. But then they also talk about a crystal, or, or some other artifact that Tartarus found and gave to the prophet from the Iridanus system as well. I thought this was... Was it from that system? I, for some reason, I thought this was Guilty Spark that he gave him. No, it's like I... No, it was a crystal. It wasn't Guilty Spark. Was it? Guilty Spark's over on the, the gas mines or whatever that are... I thought... Oh, that didn't happen yet. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know. I got myself picked up. So yeah, so he found something anyway and gave it the truth, didn't it? Yeah. He said... I, I highlighted it over here. Yeah, surrounding the Iridanus, the, it was the asteroid field. They combed the area for this asteroid field, and I think this is what's left of the crystal. Well, when the crystal exploded and they were looking at it, they kind of, they surmised that might have some of it might have gotten lost in slip space when the explosion happened. Yeah, so I think it's the same crystal. It says glittering chips of sapphire colored crystal shimmered and threw light and shadow upon the chamber's mirrored surfaces. And Tartarus says that his eight squadrons combed the asteroid field and found it. So this is presumably what's left of that crystal. And it's never seen again. (laughs) Never seen again. So I guess it wasn't that much of use, but it kind of just alludes. And then at the very end of that, I think it alludes to finding the captain of Ascendant Justice, or at least the fleet that went to... Reach and I, and I think it alludes to basically, you know, retrieve the Arbiter or Thel Vidam, yeah. and then that leads into the beginning of Halo 2. Yep. And that's First Strike. Yay! Oh my god, it's like a million books in one. Yeah, it's uh, it definitely hops around and then they come together for one final showdown. Oh, and like we said in the beginning, Will survives. Um, yay, Will. It, until he doesn't. Until he doesn't. And I, th- I like how Eric Nyland writes is that he doesn't spend a lot of time describing things. He just kind of, it's just kind of action point, action point, action point. He leaves you a lot of blanks to fill in with your brain, 
which means that his writing always has something going on. It's not, he walked through a field of grass that was three inches tall and color of deep emerald. <laughs> yeah. It's a great book. It's fantastic. It's, I forgot how action-packed it was. And like you said, it's just got so much in it. So much happens. Everybody must be fucking wrecked at the end of it. The ships are surely wrecked. He makes a lot of, he describes a lot about how much, how screwed up the ships are. And like the Spartan wounds are like vividly described. So you get the impression that these guys, I mean, Halsey even says like John would literally fall apart without his suit right now. So we have a little bit of bonus content from one of the, I think the 2010 edition. Some of it was interesting, actually. So we have four kind of little short stories, so to speak. We have one, which is a message from Charles Van Kirk to Amy. And uh, basically where he offers his condolences to her regarding Sam's death, uh, Spartan, uh, what, 3 4 uh, and, but also reminds her of their still ongoing fight against the UNSC. So is this, is this supposed to be a Sam's mother who is an insurrectionist? I don't know. Is it definitely Sam the Spartan? It's not. It, Spartan, the word, the word Spartan isn't in this at all. It just says Sam. Yeah, so I don't, I think this might, I'm not even sure what this is trying to say, but like, whose father, was it Anton, I think it was Anton's father, was the one who was meeting up with Naomi's father in Glasslands. Do you remember he yeah, had, Stefan he had met somebody? I think his, I know, or was that Will? I don't get that mixed up. I think his name was Anton, let's say the fella he met who was also a conspiracy theorist and was like out to find his son who was a Spartan adopted and he was very much, let's say, anti UNSC. So maybe it's Sam, but I didn't think so. I got the impression this was okay, just a Okay, he just got impressed person. that it was a different Sam. Just a Sam that was close to Amy. It's real vague. I'm just like, what is this trying to say? Yeah, it's vague and it, it's kind of throwaway at this point. Yeah, I guess that is true. Yeah, because he actually mentions that it's her husband and that I've had the time, I've had time to spend with Sam that I've never met you in person sort of a deal. So I, yeah, so I think it's just showcasing the diff- the the insurrectionist side of kind of that they still, they're still humans. They still feel the same emotions that the UNSC humans feel in this war between insurrectionist and UNSC controlled space. Um, then we have Tug of War, which is a short story about Oliver Birch. He's a uh, Fletcher after the Human Covenant War. I didn't read this one. Did either of you? Yeah, there's not much to it. He like he's a Fetcher, so he goes and gets slip space drives in old ships, specifically slip space drives in like derelict ships because there's a shortage of them. And the UNSC pay to have this guy go and like get them for him. He's also like a physicist, so he knows about slip space engines. He's just he didn't want to sit. In a lab. He also has a three-legged dog. (laughs) So, like, he pretty much finds this core that shouldn't be as fancy as it is, and it is. He figures out that it's, it's like, an experimental drive to see if you can, like, it does weird things where, like, it jumps a lot really fast or something, to get multiple jumps to make you jump faster or whatever. And he decides to experiment on it because he's got a hot date. (laughs) He's got a mission. He's got a mission to turn in and a hot date so he he wants to get them both done so he can go on the hot date and essentially it goes wrong it goes really wrong he has to get into a cryo tube and eject himself into space with his dog and that's pretty much where it ends so i was like okay nothing really much happens yeah it's kind of cute it it was kind of adorable It, it was like i skipped a lot of part i kind of skimmed it but it was a cute story yeah, that was there. Uh, the next one is the most interesting one, the transcript. No, I agree. Loved which this. Which totally just builds Fred and L- and Hood as being awesome. Well, because Fr- Fred becomes the leader of Blue Team after all of this, so... Totally, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's just kind of just like a psych evaluation and some kind of insight on, you know, how did you feel? What, what's, what are your mindsets behind X, Y, and well, Z? What agenda like? here? Well, and this loser's trying to, like make him feel bad and like make him second guess himself they're trying to get like something out of him it definitely gels with the halo 5 and 4 vibes of like very anti-spartan 2s of like they want to weed them out and they want to make them look bad yeah cause, i mean she even like lashes out on him about like the when they land in a reach on how like most of the Spartan casualties were technically under your command at Reach and kind of tries to blame him for it. He's like, what did you want me to do? We were going to die anyway. Yeah, yeah. And and he just kind of like doesn't have it. So yeah, it's that's probably the most, yeah, most interesting of them all. 
just to kind of give kind of that side of it. And then lastly, we have another short story called Petra, which is about the purporter Petra uh, Janik. If you recognize that name, it's from Hunt the Truth. Hunt the Truth, uh, season, is it season one or two. season two? Two. Two. And so she's the reporter kind of looking into, or no, she's not the reporter. She, she is. is like in season two, she becomes the reporter. Oh, she, okay. So anyway, so she kind of speculates on the events surrounding the final days of the uh, Human Covenant War. She knows way more than she should, too. She got amazing contacts and all the military and stuff, and she's just like piecing together what John has done and has decided to shine a light on him specifically because he's amazing. She also highlights the like anti flood weapon that Cortana found on the Ark and theorizes it wasn't the the uh, half built Halo that they found on there, Installation Eight, which is really highlighted in this story. Like it really hits, the, keeps hitting that nail. Of there is another weapon out there to fight the flood that is in Halo Ring that Cortana said there was, therefore there must be. I thought it was weird. They really were hammering home on something. I'm like, I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's like, when is this going to come in? Because we've already, we've been to the Ark a couple times, so we haven't seen anything different. But now is this? But this is before, like in terms of timeline wise, this this transmission is before we even go to the Ark, though. No, it's a, this is no, after it's Halo it's after. Three, post Halo Three. Oh, because they, she talks about the whole piece that she's writing is for the Battle of Voy, which is like it's just uh, which was the battle over where they dug up the portal for the Ark. Right, right, right. So it's to commemorate the losses of that fight because it's X number of years afterwards. I think it's one year anniversary or something coming up. I think it's actually yeah, not that long. OK, I must I missed that one then. That it's just a small point of really of what she's because she immediately veers off. I'm not writing a piece about this anymore. I'm writing about this. It's and then, about Master Chief now. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's about Cortana or whatever. Yeah, it was really the the arc thing was really weird though. Especially this came in like out in like 2011, I think, is when the this book was re released or something like that. The first re release. Yeah, there's a t- 2010 a was 10? the okay. definitive edition, and then there was the 2019 edition. I'm not sure what the 2019 edition is. I have it, but I didn't, like, as we were going through everything, I didn't know. and I didn't see any uh, differences. There was, like, a foreword at the beginning of the book. Is it? Yeah, there's a foreword in the beginning of the book in 2010 as well. I think the 2019 editions aren't actually, like, any rewrites or anything. They're just republishing a lot of the works. Oh, it might have been because I think 343 moved their publishing from Tor to um, Galleria Books. That might be what it is. Yeah, they did a lot of republishing uh, okay. in 2019. That's not like new issues or it's not like new new information. Yeah. They were just republishing it with a different publisher. Yay, good book. Oh Yay. my god. We did it, everybody. The original first trilogy. Strike. Oh my goodness. Boom. What do I have to read next? <laughs> next on our Halo Book Club, we are on our last novel to date, which is Halo Broken Circle, which conveniently oh, kind of yeah. well it takes it, it does some time jumping as well but it does kind of follow the events of this novel in a way into the halo 2 and the great schism and kind of downfall of the covenant but it also talks about the formation of the covenant and kind of gets into that so it's a it's definitely a covenant focused book as opposed to unsc or otherwise human so we don't get too many of those novels. This is the last Halo book I have to read before I've read them all. Good job. And then we will be 100% caught up, but Halo Book Club won't stop there, of course. If you're a longtime listener, you know that we also do the short stories, the comic books, uh, even the the uh, short films that they do, uh, kind of miniseries and stuff. So we still have a whole year's supply of uh, content to dive into. We just really wanted to tie up the novels. Spooky Reach. We have Spooky Reach, which will come later this year. <laughs> we have, yeah, that's the Shadows of Reach. That's so spooky. the only current, our uh, newly uh, announced novel as of, you know, mid-April 2020 that we're recording this. Yeah, so take a look at that. If if you're kind of just picking up now and you're looking where the next quote-unquote story is in this whole series, um, the next book after this would be Ghosts of Onyx. And then the Kilo 5 trilogy. So those are kind of the next four books in that sort of realm. So if you wanted to kind of go on that thread to continue, you know, where Halsey and Kelly went off to and the the things that kind of happened after Halo 3 and after the end of the Human Covenant War, 
We've done those book clubs as well, and you can find those book clubs on our website to kind of listen to those books as, or any other you know medium that you've maybe finished at a different pace than us. You know, check out our book club, see if we've talked about it. It might be a little dated depending upon when we've recorded it, but the content is still there because the content's pretty timeless. It just may not be as relative with other mediums surrounding it. But with all that, I think we'll end it there, uh, approaching the two hours. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, halopodcastevolve.com is our website. You can check out all of our past shows, our past book clubs. It also has Discord server links, Facebook group links, Patreon, Xbox Live, and other contact information. If you want to leave us a voicemail about this episode or about a previous episode that you listened to, you can give us a call at 205-EVOLVED, which is 205 386 5833 and we can play your voicemail on the show and give you kind of discussion and response to what is on your mind i have been your host Oren. Uh, i want to thank aaron who had to leave to kind of bring us through most of the show today rest in peace aaron rest in pieces you'll be remembered he was the data crystal <laughs> dust and echoes dust and echoes dust and echoes and with that everybody evolved evolved, evolved.